Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Gail Mohel, Exhibitions Curator at the Ryerson Image Center. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight for a curator's lecture by Ryan Rice. Tonight's talk accompanies Shelley Nero's current solo survey exhibition at the Ryerson Image Center. This show is a primary exhibition of the Scotiabank Contact Photography Festival. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge Toronto uh, is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee, which uh, bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and newcomers to the land have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. I'd also like to thank a few people, the staff and volunteers of the Ryerson Image Center, our colleagues in the School of Image Arts, and finally, we want to thank, thank Scotiabank uh, funders for both the Scotiabank Photography Award and the Scotiabank Contact Photography Festival. We are honored to present the annual exhibition that accompanies the prize. Our summer exhibitions, including Shelley's show, are happening in the context of this month's festival and through the summer until early August. I encourage you to see all of them, and they include Nadia Mir, Axe That Fades Away, on our Salah J. Bashir New Media Wall. In our student gallery until June 10, we have Ryan Walker, Voices in the, in the Wilderness. On our From the Collection wall, we have an installation of Ruth Kaplan's Bathers. And finally, to the north of the building, across School Street and in Lake Devo, we are hosting one of Contact's many public art installations sited throughout the city, Scott Benison Abandoned Newlandia. A couple of notes before I introduce our guest. We kindly ask that you mute your cell phones at this time. Uh, we are recording tonight's talk. Afterward, during the Q&A, we will provide a microphone for uh, any audience members who would like to ask a question. Please wait for the microphone to arrive before you speak, as we want to make uh, sure that you are being heard clearly. And finally, please note that the RIC will stay open until 9 p.m. tonight uh, after the lecture, so you have a chance to see our exhibitions. And now, it is my honor to introduce Ryan Rice. Uh, Ryan Ganyen Geaga of Ganawage uh, is an independent curator and the Delaney, Delaney Chair in Indigenous Visual Culture at the Ontario College of Art and Design University in Toronto. His curatorial career spans over 20 years in museums and gallery. Galleries, sorry. He served as the chief curator at the IAIA Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and also held a curatorial position at the Aboriginal Arts Center in Ottawa and you know, curatorial fellowships with the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria and the Walter Phillips Gallery in Banff. He was also Aboriginal curator in residence at the Carleton University Art Gallery. He received a Master of Arts degrees, uh, degree in Curatorial Studies from the Center for Curatorial Studies uh, at Bard College in New York. Um, he is the uh, uh, author of the essay, Freefall, the Photography of Shelley Nero, in Shelley's Scotiabank Photography Award book published by Steidel. The book accompanies the exhibition downstairs and can be purchased at the Rick Font Desk. And now, please join me in welcoming Ryan Rice. Asego Aguego, Arunyanas Yujats, Ganyagehaga, Dana Ganawage Nidawagenum. I want to I want to start by thanking Gael Morel for the invitation to speak in conjunction with the Rick's Contact Festival primary exhibition, and also to Natalie Spangnell for your attention and assistance and the water. Thank you. <laughs> I also want to say Nyawagowa to Shelly Nero for inviting me to write the essay the Yayago Danhaje Free File the photography of Shelley Nero for the beautiful Scotiabank Photography Awards titled Monograph. It was truly an honor. I have to remind myself to go a little slow. I'm used to giving, being given the, you got five minutes left. That doesn't, that's not gonna happen tonight, so I need to calm down a little bit. Okay. Tonight's, pre my presentation tonight is called from bits and pieces 
accumulated over the years from ideas I had written for catalog essays, articles published and unpublished, research, projects that still haven't seen the light, projects that are currently underway, critical reflections, grant applications, didactic panels, notes, and conference panel presentations, four of which I have given in the last, four, uh, last three weeks, and one tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. if anyone wants to join us at OCAD. We're doing a panel on the massey Levesque, uh, uh, re uh report. So uh, I find it important to look both ways, to look at the past, to look at the future, to look at today. And I've been spurred by, uh, spurred by my engagement with Shelley's uh, practice in, in reviewing uh, her work for, for the essay and for this exhibition. So returning to these ideas are critical to my work and engagement with the field of criticism and curatorial practice because comprehensive indigenous art histories are still scattered in boxes, uh, in brochures, in photocopies, handouts, notebooks, catalogs, journals, ephemera, video on Facebook, etc., that has yet to be contained. This flurry of knowledge or discourse resembles uh, the, the distinctiveness of our communities, reserves, and nations strewn across the land. It is mapped out, but not evidently navigated in the most tangible way. The knowledge we create to engage as well as to disrupt the art historical canon has now become a ripe resource in the age of reconciliation. The arguments, dialogue, criticism produced 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago are getting spun in heavy rotation now, but the playlist is limited. The labor to collect, locate, maintain, and draw from this amassed inquiry has been a personal and community-driven journey that I have witnessed slowly seep into art and education institutions. This image by New Generation Photography Award winning winner Meryl McMaster, Times Gravity, embodies the weight of knowledge many of us carry, balance, and need to negotiate. Uh, this burden of information, what I call it, is a contentious site in advancing indigenous visual culture, giving Indians of North America are one of the most studied, collected, and written about cultures in the world. As curators, critics, and artists, we are constantly juggling how much preliminary information is necessary without reducing significant ideologies, philosophies, epistemologies, and cosmologies to a fo footnote in an, in an essay or in an exhibition. And one example that I use uh, over the years is my refusal to footnote Gerald Visner's survivance theory. I say Google it. Uh, Tuscarora artist and scholar Jolene Ricard wrote in my exhibition catalog for Counting Coup a few years back, quote, herein lies an important conceptual dilemma for ongoing construction of contemporary indigenous experience. Is it good enough for artists and curators to generally have a sense about indigenous histories and philosophies? Or do we need to be authorities on every detail? How much of the past do we need to be author uh, how much of the past do we need to understand to imagine a future? This question weighs heavily on our scholarship and the extent of what we consider to unpack when we present it publicly. We need to ask the questions, why do society still not know much about us? And furthermore, whose art matters? For some time, I have refused to start from square one for several years now and pass the burden and share the opportunity of learning and to know your history. And it's all you that I'm looking at. This dilemma was something that I faced in drafting the essay for the Scotiabank publication. Where do I begin? Where do I start with Shelley? So this, is, this piece is called The Iroquois, a Highly Developed Matriarchal Society. It was key to introducing or uh, entry point for my uh, work with the essay, and it's not in the exhibition. So my entry point to delve into Shelley's work is through Haudenosaunee epistemologies and the rich continuity anchored in our relationship to family, community, nation, and land, the heart of Haudenosaunee perseverance that advances our society, spirit, and sovereignty. For me, this work anchored my inquiry and seized the spirit and intent of Shelley's work. In the essay for the exhibition catalog I wrote about this work, which, which again I said is not in the exhibition. 
Shelley Nero's iconic hand-tinted photographic triptych, the Iroquois is a highly developed matriarchal society from 1989, stemmed from reading generic Western textbook interpretations all her life. The ethnographic rhetoric was deeply embedded within the curricular limitations that surveyed Indians of Canada for the required history credits uh, taught across North American secondary and post-secondary schools. The compulsory knowledge transferred through the canon of Western scholarship greatly influenced how Canadians and the world came to superficially understand, misunderstand, or develop, uh, devalue Indigenous cultures. A citizen of the Mohawk Nation, one of the six sovereign nations that compromised the League of Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, Nero questioned the statement's validity and how it affected and spoke to her in the present, and she confronted, she confronted the conventional, essentialist, and static framing that continued to push forward without scrutiny. The defiant result was expressed through her proactive recentering of mainstream society's imposed male-dominated hierarchical views specifically its matriarchal representation. This approach would come to define but not limit her photographic works throughout her 30 plus year career. The Iroquois is a highly developed matriarchal society was timely in building Aniro's creative capacity, given teeth in her interdisciplinary practice, which includes photography, painting, beadwork, film, and sculpture installation. The work specifically addresses and confronts the subjective confines asserted by institutionalized imagination and canonized caricatures interpreted and upheld through Western literature, academic research, dusty dioramas, and media depictions. Ethno German ethnologist or Aust Austrian ethnologist Christian Fies notes, quote, the white man's intellectual struggle, struggle with the Iroquois left prominent traces in popular culture the history of anthropology, the peace and women's movement, and in efforts to establish the foundations of alternate, alternative lifestyles, end of quote. Being challenged to live up to the white man's gaze, Nero toys with these expectations, employing coy humor, wit, and irony in her work as strategic forms of resistance. Nero's mother, shown in the, uh, the image, June Chiquita Doxator is the distinguished matriarch featured in the Iroquois is highly developed matriarch society. She appears in three separate poses sitting under a vintage hood hair dryer in her daughter's kitchen, taking care of important business herself. Each image in the triptych celebrates the matriarch's joy, spirit, solace, and freedom as she basks, basks in the process of being pampered as a mother should. Nero situates her in the contemporary moment and far away from embedded ethno-historical Iroquoian gender roles that would imagine her pounding corn, <coughs> tending crops, and bearing children. Nero's playful triptych lifts the burden placed upon the matriarch for a few moments by equating self-care and well-being as, critical, as critical forms of Haudenosaunee sovereignty subversive through the actions granted by survivants and strong will that are contrary to the colonial practice of repressing women. At the same time, this piece allows Nero to contend with the issues of domestic abuse, contradictory of matriarchal societal and kinship power. She questions the logic and her own generation's decision to accept a social structure adopted through an imposed colonial dominance that directly affects the critical role of women as leaders and mothers of their nation and caretakers of their families. The triptych is lighthearted in spirit, but acts as a proposition to restore balance and elevate the significance of equity and power of individual, individuality embedded in the matrilineal intellectual tradition and values of the Haudenosaunee. The Iroquois is a highly developed matriarchal society, subverts the oppressive and adopted learned patriarchal authority and reframes it outside of its conventional historical context as a mechanism for Nero to present her own experiences and those of other Nguyenhue women. Nero's own labor is carefully considered, embellished and ironically asserted by the tedious process of hand tinting each black and white photograph and carefully incorporating significant traditional Haudenosaunee aesthetics into the matte board frame. 
The process of boring the designs into the mat board permeates the surface with considerable cultural integrity. The darkroom rigor of developing analog film and processing images in, is consistent with expressing the narrative as a layered and complex engagement. The graceful touch and tactility of the hand collapses the domestic and artistic, traditional and contemporary, analog and digital, imposing a unique perspective to consider within the history of photography, memory, and cultural specificity. Nero's ability to shift perspectives away from a superimposed colonial lens is significant because it is supported through her profound sense of indigeneity that focuses on and centers lived experiences, community, relationships, security, identity, and place. The centering or center Shelley occupies with her work is profound. For a 2004 exhibition at the National Museum of American Indian in New York City, I wrote in the essay, quote, self-exiled Cherokee artist Jimmy Durham claimed, I feel certain that I would address the entire world if I only had a place to stand. Shelley Nero has contemplated that place for a long time, finding it where matriarchal society is highly developed. By speaking strongly through her work, Nero reminds us that the tradition and lineage of Iroquoian matriarch matters. This is a picture of Shelley and I, uh, the day she began installing the exhibition. We had coffee early in the morning, and I was excited uh, to be able to uh, spend that moment with her. <coughs> Shelley Nero, the artist and her work, has been imperative to my practice as an artist, curator, and educator in many ways because she has been generous and genuine, a friend and a role model. Throughout the 1990s, her work became somewhat accessible and was a buzz. It was fresh and daring, bold and brass, profound and amusing. But most importantly, it was us. And that is, that is what I appreciate from her work so much. Shelley granted us a position, a center for us to reflect upon and see ourselves as contenders and contributors within the ecosystems of galleries, exhibitions, museums, and her work continues to rouse and transcend across community and audience. The center she formed, along with many others, for us is key to the theory of survivance, and I am thrilled that she has received the well-deserved accolades thus far. I, I was also, I already mentioned, was honored she chose me to have written the accompanying essay in support of her award. Two works that have left a significant impression on my practice and continue to influence my scholarship are Carl Beam's Bury the Ruler series and Shelley Nero's The Shirt. Both works speak of truths, advanced decolonial strategies, and our forms of resistance. From my exhibition essay for Counting Coup, I wrote about Beam's work. By inserting and acknowledging an indigenous presence within a colonial narrative, history becomes more relevant, true, and can achieve balance across intellectual, political, social, historic, and cultural landscapes. Acts of declaration challenge and, and disrupt the dominant grip of a commonly accepted yet prejudiced Western history. Carl Beam diligently challenged the colonial project through his critical body of work, and on a side note, you could see his Columbus suite. His works, Burying the Ruler and Rulers, symbolically enact a traditional sense of balance rather than, rather than an imperialistic dominance. For Beam, the ruler, a Western tool for measurement, acts as a metaphor of power, control, and supremacy. Through the bold symbolic gesture of burying the ruler, Beam collapses forms of power based on dominance, clearing the way for others to be acknowledged by and participated in a realistic post-colonial discourse. Beam's work is a critical call to action. The shirt. The shirt, on the other hand, exposes the violence inflicted upon Nguyenhue and our land. In the photographic series uh, that is in the exhibition and video that I'm gonna show shortly, Nero excavates the collective memory of more than 500 indigenous nations in North America. 
Her map unfolds, exposing the landscape identified as Turtle Island, where she pinpoints the everlasting beating hearts of these distinct and diverse communities. Nero locates the spirit of indigenous sovereignty within each nation's vitality and endurance, opposing neo-colonialism and all of its complications and implications. As she observes the enormous shift in territorial borders and boundaries due to colonization, Nero heeds a collective voice that declares, this land is ours. The incantatory ancestral voice is loud and clear, but only for those who listen. It moves across the land, making noises through encounters with forms of displacement and destruction. It hushes to silence, overwhelmed by development and progress. From a community level to a national scope, many have tried to make the collective voice heard. And now I'd like to show the, sh the shirt.
all I get is the shirt. It's, it's, uh, it's something that sticks with me since I've seen it, and I think about it quite often, both uh, Carl Beam's work and uh, Shelley's work here. So the shirt offers a brutal, truthful message that speaks to a history of invasion and settler, settler relationships that indigenous people have experienced worldwide. It's not just Canada and the United States. It extends beyond. The shirt is a souvenir, a memory, a burden, and a legacy that is worn by many. Adages and bold public assertions of native agency, such as we are here, we are still here, and a vocabulary that includes words such as unceded, unsurrendered, treaty, seniory, sovereignty, insurgence, resurgence, and reconciliation have infiltrated popular culture, social media, art, film, music, literature, as a platform for pro uh, political protest to achieve social justice and that, that stems from the Oka crisis to idle no more, and now exemplify proactive nonviolent forms of resistance to colonialism and stubborn prejudices, prejudices embedded in local, national, and global histories. By affirming the tenacity of Ungwehume survivance across generations and revealing narratives that counter dominant and imagined truths, Ungwehue instill and encourage and acknowledge their distinct presence, stewardship, and legacy linked to place, history, and knowledge. Art and curatorial practice play a key role in this because its critical, nuanced, visual, and interpreted voice has the power to infiltrate as a perfect form of communication to confront acts of denial as well as celebration we can witness if we look and listen. Sadahun Sadat, listen closely. How many times do I have to tell you this is Indian land? How many times do I have to tell you this is our land? How many times do I have to tell you learn how to say Haudenosaunee? How many times do I have to tell you we are here, we are still here? How many times do I have to tell you indigeneity is not a product? How many times do I have to tell you we pay tax. How many times do I have to tell you to have a status card has no relationship to being lucky? How many times do I have to tell you we have many words for art? How many times do I have to tell you Jimmy Durham is not Cherokee? How many times do I have to tell you water is life? How many times do I have to tell you you break a treaty, you break the law? How many times do I have to tell you no pipelines? How many times do I have to tell you justice for Colton, justice for Tina? How many times do I have to tell you change the name? How many times do I have to tell you listen to Cindy Blackstock? So I recognize the act of listening and telling can be a critical tool to indigenous settler relationships in the age that we are uh, faced with and living in right now. It's a way to advance uh, our society. And uh, a project I worked at, and I apologize, I don't have the Im some images to support it. Some, uh, some other hard drive. But anyway, on January 23rd in 2000, uh, 2016, I curated a four hour endurance uh, reading uh, titled Well Read, Activating the TRC's Calls to Action. And I thought this, uh, this proposed uh, action that was uh, placed uh, in front of us nationally was something that people were recognizing, but something that people didn't read. So I thought that if we came together as a community and we read them out loud, people would hear it. And we did that for four hours. I, I, I set up a four hour time uh, period to do this reading. I didn't know if anyone was gonna show up. I was about to take this endeavor on by myself if I had to. Uh, but, but as a curator, I thought it was a way to engage uh, a community. Uh, the first community that I was interested in engaging in was OCAD University. And colleagues, friends, and I also use social media to get the word out. And uh, within the four hour uh, reading, uh, we went through four rounds of the 94 calls to action. 
And it was a profound experience because people have said they wouldn't have read it, they wouldn't have looked at it if they didn't participate in this action. So within four hours, people start to listen. People start to think. And people start to sort of uh, consider where they are located within these 94 calls to action. So I, I think it was an important process that we need to we need to do over and over. How many times do I have to tell you? Sometimes it doesn't get through, and we need to, even though it's a tiresome uh, and laborious effort, it's something that I realize we have to do over and over and over again. So with contact, this festival, as a current site of contemplation, literally and metaphorically, it is also a site of possibilities to unsettle. Public works such as Scott Benison Abandon's Monument Intervention Newlandia de Bamanigaguad, which is just outside here, is still overshadowed by the bronze colonial beacon of Egerton Ryerson and the messiness of geographical strata of land acknowledgments. Nadia Quadabin's collateral exhibition Indigenous Rising gets camouflaged in the hustle and bustle of Kensington Market. Carolyn Monet's History Shall Speak for Itself is a standout at TIFF because it's positioned in a place of expectations that are often associated with the street level cinematic empire. The presence and inclusion of indigenous art is a sign of embrace, yet it calls attention to what, what Wanda Nanabush recently said at a conference in Los Angeles. She pointed out that there is a difference between projects being indigenous led or ones of indigenous inclusion. There are instances we still need to consider as part of the ongoing strategies and conversations. Otherwise, we as indigenous curators, artists, our practice is not necessary. We don't need to be there. The reality of inclusion of indigenous practices within the mainstream is still far from perfect and requires a lot of attention at every level. The exhibition facing forward at critical distance that's part of uh, the Contact Festival would represent the only opportunity for indigenous curatorial practice to be realized at Contact. By moving forward contemporaneously, an active sense of presence over absence is critical to maneuver and expand our position from the margins on one hand and the center that Shelley occupies on the other. The shift is not only specific to art, but rather an act to disrupt and challenge the commonly accepted privileged narrative of colonial histories and stubborn prejudices embedded in history. And more precisely, uh, it contributes to building an indigenous art history, which leads us back to the challenge we face and continue to do so in getting to tell the story. I'd like to conclude with a specific relationship established at contact shown here named the Kaswanta the Turo Wampum, which should act, which does act as a reminder of the responsibilities of equity in today's social justice. Do you hear me now? Skanagoa, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for Ryan tonight? Please raise your hand for the microphone to come to you. <laughs> Hello, my name is John Hackley. Uh, I just want to tell uh, how much the First Nation people with ceremonies uh, have been uh, helping me to uh, be reconnected with, uh, uh, with nature, with Mother Nature, with mothers, with the respect, with this word, simply the simple word, respect. Uh, I'm coming from France, um, Westerns, you know, also colonialism, uh, kind of old culture. And these Westerns are just observing everywhere as about continuing destroying with no respect our environment. Uh, I'm a manager, 
I manage companies, so I'm into the really deep material world. And all my life is inside this deep material world. So following, searching, doing all my life, how can I get back to this respect? And from the teachings that the First Nation honored me by giving me back this universal knowledge that we all do have. And, and I find just a wall. So I, I know we are connected and the, the will, the strong, uh, who we are is about connection. Every one of us is about being connected, not just between humans, but between everything. And the modern scientifics is starting to have this vocabulary and observes what the First Nations knowledge still keep surviving this knowledge and transmit whatever how much they suffer of this being destroyed. So, you know, my question is how to teach us respect. The big question. Um, I mean, I, it goes back to the title of my uh, talk, How Many Times Do I Have to Tell You? This is something that indigenous people have been saying over and over and over and over and over again for years. It's the basic principles and foundation uh, of our culture, of our cosmologies, of the way we relate to the spaces that we occupy and our relationships to all life. I mean, so the, the, the literature is out there. I mean, the world has studied us for so long that the philosophies are, are, are shared to some extent. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, humanity finding a, a space to accept that. So your first step, I, I, I gave a talk uh, three weeks ago in Montreal to American curators, and I, and I, I titled it The Decolonial Primer. So the, your first step is to know where you are. Do you know where you are? So that's the first step, is most Canadians do not know where they are. So understanding the land on which they occupy and are settled upon is critical to understanding the environment that they participate in. Uh, most people here will travel across the world and do research into the cultures that they're visiting. People don't do that in Canada. Canadians don't do that. They don't know where their house, where their house is located, whose territory that space is, what those relationships have been, what urban centers have always been uh, routes and trade routes and movement and occupation. So I mean, it goes back to this, this, this treaty was from the 1600s. People understood uh, the idea of respect. The respect was between two cultures, the, the settlers and the locals. And it, and it was about this uh, space of equity. It was about living together and acknowledging each other's uh, existence uh, without interference. Um, so, so these things are embedded within, within the knowledge systems that are being shared from generations to generation. And it counters or it, or it, or it uh, sort of... Um, pushes against the idea that this land was barren, this land was empty, this land was here for the taking. And we have to understand those histories. If you don't understand those histories, I don't think you can get to a level of respect because you become the owner of property, you become a person who needs to not sit in traffic. You, you, you need to understand where, you're, where you are located and how your relationships to, to the space and to the people that you are living with. So, th so these, are, these aren't new tactics, right? These are tactics that have been uh, you know, um, embedded within the knowledge of, of our systems. I mean, we have the Gahande uh, Ardiwadekwa, which is the Thanksgiving address, which is to address everything that is 
that we're thankful for. And, and this, is a, is, this is a significant reminder on a daily basis that you have a space here to be part of that ecosystem and, and there's equity across the board, right? So I mean, by, by, by doing the research or be participating and just becoming conscious of the efforts to, to be kind to each other, to respect the land, to recycle. I mean, there's all these different things, but it, it, in many cases, it goes back to Carl Beam's uh, painting that I showed you, is Burying the Ruler. There needs to be a form of equity because there can't be hierarchies in knowledge systems which is what we're experiencing within educational institutions now. We're going through decolonial strategies to try to embed indigenous knowledge because it's rich. And, and it's in many ways, it, it's, it's sort of like the answers that have always been on the table. Um, in 1974, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy went to the uh, United Nations with a, uh, and there's a publication called The Basic Call to, to Consciousness to warn the, the, the world of the destruction that we are facing environmentally. So these things aren't new issues. You know, we have to, how many times do I have to tell you? 1974 is how many years ago? 50 years ago? 40 years ago? This has been on our minds for a long time. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Greg. <laughs> so could you talk a little bit about the boundaries and, uh, of sharing and your experience with, you know, attempting to create this ethical space, such as the gallery, and, um, you know, do you, is there a point where there's only so much information you share in terms to to force or to coerce a, a reciprocity mm -hmm. of respect? I think it's about uh, vigor, and you start off fighting, and then you start getting tired of the burden of how many times do I have to tell you, right? Um, I mean, but because I, I start looking through notes, and I'm like, these are things that I keep saying over and over again. I just republished an essay that I wrote in 2001 on post-colonialism that I presented in Montreal at the Museum of Contemporary Art. And it's still valid today. The, the information is very relevant in terms of recognizing indigenous art within the bigger field. And uh, what, I, what I've come to terms with in these cases is these aren't our spaces. These galleries, these museums, aren't our spaces, these institutions. Um, we have to enter. Uh, we have to find allies to help us get in the door. Uh, we have to disrupt. Uh, but we also have to be respectful because, you know, they, they're, they're spaces that aren't ours. And I wonder, you know, where it's 2018 and we still don't have those spaces. And what do those spaces look like? What do those spaces look like that we would create? And I don't think at this point they would be very different because most of our artists are trained and curators are trained within the white cube. The work is situated to be seen in that space. When it's taken out of that space, it doesn't work, right? And as a curator, over the years, my biggest, I, sometimes I don't even look at art anymore, I look at space. It's about how I activate space and how I look at how it flows and how I look at the ceiling and the lights and all, you know, all these other things be, have become critical in terms of me positioning indigenous art in that space because I want it to be looked at as equal. I don't want the red walls. I don't want the uh, terracotta, the turquoise paintings. On the, you know, I want it to be seen within that equity. And that equity at this point means that I have to work in that space, and I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where, as you know, where I would create another space. Uh, in the exhibition I did in the fall, uh, "Raise a Flag," uh, works from the Indigenous Art Collection, uh, 
at the on-site gallery was the inaugural exhibition, and I realized the only way for me to activate that exhibition was to be present as the curator. Because I was the guest, and I didn't know how it was going to be managed for four months. So I offered uh, to be present for anybody who wanted to get, have a tour. And I think that's critical. That education component is, is critical. And it goes back to your question about how do you create respect, right? How do you understand respect? So that was the educational component of the exhibition was, was, pro, was a profound experience because I met 41 school, not just school groups, but groups, and toured them on, on anywhere from an hour to two hours. And I could see how people have had to think about what I was, what I was presenting because I positioned it as, this is your history. This is not only indigenous art history, but it's also Canadian art history. It's also global art history. So how do these works situate in all those realms? And I think that was one of the ways that I seen change. Rather than me go in, put it up in an exhibition, go back and do administrative stuff, it was being present. And, and, I, and I think it's something that people should experience more often, actually. Like to be there, to, to, to sit and, and to watch people's reaction, to answer questions. I mean, it's taxing, but, but for me it was an important, uh, because it was my first show in Toronto f that, I, that I've done probably in eight years or something like that. So it's the, the participation of, just like in our dreaming um, and desires ceremony of midwinter, the participation requires you to be present. And in that, then the, because it's, you know, because I also struggling with the return, the return to a, appear a, a mindset before disruption, mm -hmm. before contact. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a difficult journey. So. And, I, and I, I mean, that's where this idea that Wanda brought up before was indigenous ed and indigenous inclusion. There's, there's an element of presence and absence with it, with it, within that that either gives more agency or less agency, right? Hi, thank you. Um, Great talk, thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering in terms of what you were just saying about, because I'm a museum educator, um, and I've been in museums for about 12 years as a teacher type, and, um, and my museum is trying to include more indigenous content, right? Um, trying its best, I guess. <laughs> um, and, but I guess it's a more of a social context, um, because as educators, came here with a colleague, because that's why I keep looking at her. But anyway, just that point. Um, about how to bring that up socially, because we've often gotten shut down by teachers who bring their schools to the gallery for like indigenous content art, um, stuff like that, or like social we have justice. social justice stuff where we happen to include more indigenous content, or decolonized, quote unquote decolonization type tours that are based on indigenous artists taking back certain types of spaces. Um, but we get shut down a lot because the shirt was hanging at the gallery for a long time, um, and somewhat uh, a colleague brought up um, engaging with that or engaging with some sort of context of in residential schools, and the, the teacher brought, shut them down and told them that they were bringing up content that was too sensitive for their students. Um, and this, and I'm on, and it wasn't me or any of the other people of color, but it was another white educator. And they shut them down, and it wasn't in a good way um, because they weren't ready for it. And I'm like, also a grade nine student. Um, and it's not like we're going into the, the in-depth abuses that happened at residential school, um, but like bringing it up that they, they exist, you know? Because mm -hmm. um, I often bring up, because I'm the only in educator there that's also indigenous and black, um, but I also bring up that I could have been in residential school till I was nine, right? And bringing up that and talking about that as a person who only just turned 30. Um, so just socially bringing it up in a gallery space, I guess, is something what I'm asking about is, yes, being there is important. Mm -hmm. And um, having art that's reflecting of our histories and our stories and stuff like that is very important. But socially, when enga engaging with students and teachers who aren't ready, 
um, but they're expected to because the Ontario government instituted the art um, curriculum that was mandatory for all Ontario's people to take that art class mm -hmm. on Indigenous content. Um, how do you engage with them when they're not willing to engage with it in their students year round? Um, and we only have that one hour or 75 minutes in our case to talk to them about that. So um, just, I guess, more social implements of that discussion. I guess one of the things that has really shifted within uh, Canadian society is that uh, we are on the news. You turn on the news in the morning, there's always an Indigenous story, there's always Indigenous content. It's interesting that it's almost there on a daily basis. So, I mean, hot topics, issues of residential school have been unpacked in this country, the calls to action have been unpacked, the missing and murdered women have been unpacked. So there's all these issues that are public and they have, have a huge presence and resource to understand what those things are. So it's not unknown information, it's public information. And when you have governments who are supporting the initiatives to get this information public and to get the society to understand this, um, shutting down isn't, isn't the way to do this. I mean, because, you know, education is about, you know, advancing our knowledge. So, so I think that, I mean, a lot of times um, the students who are coming up will be living in a different society because they're going to know multiculturalism in a different sense that multiculturalism was framed you know, way back when. They're going to understand indigenous history in a different way that it's been framed in the past as being in the past and non-existent. Um, so, but also that presence and absence plays a big role is because people think indigenous people are somewhere else, right? So when you bring it into the gallery, it's an opportunity to, to have those discussions and to, you know, it, it's like stirring the fire and it's to getting kids, kids engaged or students, whoever's on the tour engaged. And you'll have people who are very dismissive, resistant to something that they don't know. But I mean, it's, it's important to, again, how many times do I have to tell you? So, breaking down those myths, breaking down those stereotypes are still there. Um, and, and these issues are floating around on social media. Last year, you know, Joseph Boyden issue, the Amanda, the appropriation issue in Toronto. So, I mean, there's things that are, are, are visible and are, are, you know, you can turn to open the, you know, the newspaper and you'll see stories. So there's resources available for anybody who wants to access that, you know, to learn more about, about that stuff. Uh, hi, Ryan. Um, it's a show. <laughs> <Hi>. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> thanks for the, the talk, as always, uh, uh, and particularly in, in bringing up some, some very pertinent points about uh, the, the present moment and, the, and how we're moving towards a, a future that may be promising if we, 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 can, we can think through it. Uh, I, I do have a question that you, you've actually alluded to about the, um, the, the institutions that we inhabit, um, both art and educational, and, uh, and you're absolutely right that they are, they are owned differently, right? They're coming from mainstream places, coming from white spaces. Um, uh, Isidore Day was on the news a few days ago talking about the possibility of the need for uh, um, uh, a First Nations University in Ontario, as, a, as I have in Saskatchewan. Um, but he, uh, and, and his, his line was to say that, uh, that these mainstream institutions uh, um, have gone as far as they can. Like, they just, they can't do this anymore. So I wonder what your thoughts are. Uh, it's an intriguing space. Do, is, is it time, uh, is, there, is there energy for creating new spaces? Or is it, as you said, uh, you know, tr artists are trained within a certain white cube mentality, so maybe they'll just be re replicating it. What are your thoughts about the future of institutions? I think as long as the door is open, there's possibilities of creating or establishing, let's say, a sovereign space. I think sovereign spaces can exist within 
white institutions, right? I, I think that there's those opportunities that um, can can be quite uh, quite successful. But you you know you're still working within these hierarchical structures, and you're still working with those granting agencies that you have to get funding. You know, we're looking at granting agencies in Canada, uh, Canada Council, for one, um, hasn't always been the easiest place, but it's still bureaucratic, right? And tomorrow, we're talking on Massey Levesque, which sort of dismissed indigenous art from actually existing. So from going from the 50s to today is, is quite significant. And being part of that change where I came in as a young artist involved with uh, SCANA, which was the Society of Canadian Native Artists of, Artists of Native Ancestry, who were doing huge lobbying efforts to get their work recognized on a national level. Um, but they got there, and then it sort of collapsed, right? So how do you keep that momentum? How do you build that momentum? And is it just recycling ideas over and over and over again? Uh, I was part of the founding of the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective. Uh, it's well into 10 years, but it goes like this, right? And it only exists based on funding, the funding models that are, that are out there. Um, I, I, I call Canada Council our, well, our art welfare system. Um, <laughs> Because I've worked in the United States, I went to school in the States, and it's a whole different space to work from, um, which is one of the reasons why I came back north, right? To, because I, th I thought my work can advance further within this climate of sort of recognition, acceptance, and disruption. Where in the US, indigenous people are not mentioned. You have white, Black, Hispanic, Asian, and then it just peters out. No mention of indigenous. So working within that within that system, and within you know the the climate of the kind of government that was coming in, and you already see the prejudice, racism, and all that. You know, I was like, I need to get back home. You know, because I I felt that I have the more grounding within my space, within territory, within support to do those kind of changes. And, and I think it's, I mean, it's, it's personal commitment and, and how, do you, do you, how do you challenge those institutions once you're inside? Karen? One more question, Karen. I was afraid to speak without the mic, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you look at me like, don't talk. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the hope that may exist in young people and potentially creating, as you were saying, a different way of knowing and understanding that may lead to the sovereign space being front of mind for the next generation of artists and curators. And it may be, as you've already alluded to, that it's this ebb and flow, but um, I, speaking as you know, uh, a black woman and watching some of the, I think, we watch uh, indigenous communities for markers as to how to navigate some of these things. And we took the risk uh, with band of just figuring out how to get our own space. Um, so we didn't have to ask anybody for entry. And it's not a lot of space, but that autonomy is, as you said, it just changes the equation. But to your point, it's still the white box. Yeah. So there are times where we, have, we sit back and we think, what are we doing? Because we're doing this the way they say we should do it. And it's mind bending that even when you own your own space, you still paint it all the wilds white. Um, because it was like, we need to, and it was a conscious decision. We thought, we need to start by just making sure we get the other's attention. And then once we get it, we can start messing with what that means. But now we're having a struggle of figuring out how do we unhinge ourselves from what that means. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if you can talk a bit about. Well, I think those I think those are decolonial strategies that we ourselves have to decolonize because we are most of us are trained within these institutions, um, and and it's a personal journey in many ways and and finding people who want to join that journey. Um, 
and and I think that uh, the youthfulness and and sort of like uh, the energy is what young artists need to take on. You know, you need to get your work seen, right? Like, you can't wait. No one's going to knock on your door anymore. That doesn't happen. So, like, and you have, I mean, there's there's a significant platform to get your work seen. Social media is incredible, and I'm surprised more artists don't use it effectively because I watch that because that's how I get to see what's going on as well, right? So that's why I stay on it because it's it's an important tool for me. But I think those decolonial strategies are are important for us to position in our practice and to always keep not in the back, but like right in the forefront. Um, and just, I think mentorship is critical. The mentoring of the next generation coming forward. And like, I, I've seen stuff the other day and I said, they really should have had a curatorial consultant. You know, this, this show is a mess, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, how much money did go into this and you can't see anything here. So, I mean, there's a lot of things where you learn by practice, but I, but I think that there's, Canada is not that big in terms of the art field, so the network is there. I mean, it's not hard to reach out to somebody. Shelley Nero was somebody who I reached out to right after the Oka crisis. She was at Concordia. I went to her talk. I shyly went up to her after and said, I'm Mohawk from Gunawage. She's just like, here's my number. Uh, keep in touch. And I mean, that established uh, a relationship that I have with her, you know, like we started Nation to Nation, uh, First Nations Art Collective, and Shelley was somebody who constantly participated with us. One of her words as advice is she's like, why, why reject anything? Keep doing what you're doing, keep exhibiting. So she, she from the start, has always participated in a lot of activities that I was doing way back in the early 90s. So I think that reciprocity that Greg talks about is something that needs to continue, but people forget because that history is not as easy accessible. What we probably wrote in 1990 exists from a typewriter on a sheet of paper in someone's box. So when you see somebody doing something very similar to what you were doing, they're like, they didn't have access to that history. So that's why I think it's important that you know, now that we're in the academy, many of us who've been curators are now working with institutions. There's an opportunity for us to bring all that knowledge together somehow beyond like just an archive that you're going to go to, but publications, journals. I'm thinking of open source accessibility because I think that information needs to be out there. I would love to share this essay with everybody, but <laughs> you have to buy the book, right? So, you know, um, I'm sort of more interested in that now, is how do I get what I've done out to the public? And that's a decolonial strategy because, you know, people don't want all that stuff out there for free. There's a question back. Okay, one last question. I get two last questions. <laughs> That's it. I'll keep my answer short. Um, I'll see if I can phrase this carefully. Um, but to what extent is um, telling a collective and personal history through novelty T-shirts an apt metaphor for what I'm sensing going through here, trying to navigate through a bureaucratic system? It's making it visible. Yeah. I mean, it, it's using art as a strategy to, is a platform to tell the story, right? When the visual voice, when the voice was silenced for so long and erased, and I mean, that's what that piece was about. It was about er removing us from the land and addressing that situation. So the shirt, we're all wearing it. The books that Meryl McMaster is carrying are on my shoulders, right? 
So these things are what artists are bringing forward to us. And as a curator, I'm mediating those ideas for the public to see. So I think, I mean, it's, it's a critical element because we are visual people. We are oral people. So I, I, I think that our relationships, we have to experience these things. We have to experience each other. You know, you can't just like the interest button on Facebook. You have to come here and sit in the chair hmm. to experience this or else watch it at <laughs> some other time. But you know, that moment, you can't replicate it, right? You have to be there. You have to go to the exhibition. You have to see the art. I mean, I never seen the Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, but they say you need to go see it. So these things are things, you know, art is something that we have to see. And then it allows us to think. And it allows us to unpack all what is embedded. And that's what excites me about indigenous art, because it's a way to tell our stories. And it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. You know, there's a surface, and then there's a depth. Hi. In the back. <laughs> um, lovely talk, by the way. Um, I, my question is, um, well, I guess I'll first start that. I work in an art gallery, and um, we've even had um, Meryl McMaster's Confluence come to her, as well as Earthlings a few um, months ago. And one of my favorite things about my job is to interact with the gallery goers. However, I do find it difficult, and I'll be honest, um, engaging um, works of indigenous artists because, not out of apathy, but because those are not my histories to tell. Those are not, um, I don't have that knowledge as a settler. And so my question for you is, how can those working in galleries or institutions be mindful about the approach they're taking when discussing art, and should we hold spaces to do so in the first place? Well, I think one of the first things is to do is to email, pick up the phone, talk to the artists. I mean, that's, that's, uh, an important element is, is artists like to tell their story, right? Artists like to be heard. Artists are willing to talk to you um, and to interpret their work. I mean, um, I think it's, it's key in, in that educational and that experience between people um, because uh, otherwise it gets dismissed too easily. So that's something that we've experienced for a long time is that, uh, that you say this is indigenous art and they're like, I don't get it, you know? So if I showed you the wampum belt and told you this was from European art, you might, not, you, know, you might not even think twice about it and say, oh yeah, it's art. You know, when we go into a, a Western framed gallery, there's an expectation that we know the history and that's sort of like what I'm trying to unpack is like how many times do I have to tell you? Indigenous people have been here. Indigenous knowledge is important. Uh, we have made art for a long time. Uh, and we're present. So I mean, those are the things that uh, you should walk in with an open mind. You should be able to talk about the work. The one thing that I, I, I sort of get upset about is I was recently at the ROM and I, I stood back and I was listening to a school group and they talked about indigenous people in the past. They said they ate this. They didn't say they eat this. And that makes a big difference within, you know, educating people. So people will still think they don't exist, right? So I think those are ways of, of developing um, you know, skills of how, how does it relate to the present? How does it relate to the present day? What issues can be brought out that are current? With the show Raise a Flag, every piece in the show, I was able to talk about something that was probably on the news that morning or the day before. Everything from water to land to residential school um, to colonization. I mean, these are all things that I was able to tease out of it. So finding spaces to to pull something from, I think, is is your job as an educator and that you could share with the public. Thank you so very much, Ryan. This was enlightening. Thank you so much. Uh, Shelley will be back. <laughs> Shelley will be back for a tour of the uh, her exhibition uh, on June 13. So two weeks from now, Wednesday. June 13th. So come back.
to hear her. Thank you so very much for coming out tonight. Thank you, everybody.